Mr. Vice Chancellor, Mr. Deputy Vice Chancellor, distinguished members of the academic staff and the non-academic staff, emeritus professors, students, ladies and gentlemen. I belong to the old school of diplomacy, unlike the new school whose antics in New York have been publicized in the media. And so I have selected the security of a prepared script, unlike Professor Pieris, who is as an emeritus professor at liberty to exchange anecdotes from the past. But let me begin, like him, saying that an invitation to address the University of Peradeniya occasion is always an honor and a welcome opportunity to drink again at the academic spring that nourished me for four golden years of my youth. However, the task of evaluating the national contribution of this state-funded university, 60 years after it was declared more open than usual, is daunting, particularly for an alumnus who graduate, graduated over half a century ago and has spent a career abroad as a diplomat and an international civil servant. Ladies and gentlemen, the Times Higher Education World University rankings, in which Peradeniya has still to figure prominently, are the accepted global university performance table to judge world-class universities in their core mission of teaching, research, knowledge transfer, and international outlook. Our own Ministry of Higher Education has ranked Peradeniya, I'm told, as second among all Sri Lankan universities. The Wikipedia entry for the university states, and I quote, the University of Peradeniya hosts eight faculties, including the newly added Allied Health Science faculty, two postgraduate institutes, 10 centers, 73 departments and teaches about 11,000 students in the fields of medicine, agriculture, arts, science, engineering, dental sciences, veterinary medicine, and animal science and allied health science. In 2010, according to university ranking by academic performance, URAP, University of Peradeniya ranked 1,426th in the world it is the only Sri Lankan university ranked under URAP." Unquote. The World Bank has concluded that preoccupations about university rankings reflect the general recognition that economic growth and global competitiveness are increasingly driven by knowledge and that universities play a key role in that context. Indeed, Rapid advances in science and technology across a wide range of areas, from information and communications technologies to biotechnology to new materials, provide great potential for countries to accelerate and strengthen their economic development. The big question I have to respond to this morning, without the benefit of accessing any empirical studies, are these. Has Peradeniya achieved its stated vision? And I quote, to be a center of excellence in higher education with national and international standing, unquote. And secondly, has this university fulfilled the mission proclaimed on its website? And I quote again, to contribute to the development of a knowledge-based society with social sensitivity, ethical rectitude, and economic prosperity through education, research, dissemination of knowledge, and active participation in national policy formulation, and development in an efficiently managed, intellectually stimulating, and harmonious university environment." Unquote. By realizing both its vision and its mission, even partially, Peradeniya has made a national contribution. My hope, of course, is that it will do better, but for that, more resources are needed and conducive conditions must be created. Would the accountability of Peradeniya for its national contribution be less demanding 
if it was not state funded and had a mix of state and private funds. Standards of academic excellence, I argue, do not and cannot vary according to the source of funding for universities. And so if, as seems to be the intention of the government, we have a number of private universities launched, then they should also be judged by the same rigorous criteria of making a national contribution and not serving the ends of a particular economic or social class. Universities are essential to a country's economy and society. They benefit their local and national economies through creating jobs, delivering highly skilled individuals to the economy, and through research, developing new products and services. Universities also benefit society through improving livelihood opportunities for individuals, contributing to greater community cohesion and social inclusions. I see Peradeniya's impact as being largely cultural, influencing the national ethos as no other university has done. Let me begin with the intangible benefits that I think Peradeniya has contributed to as an institution, and that has been primarily in the realm of values. The concept of a university, as it originated both in Europe and in Asia, was essentially that of a community of teachers and scholars. The transition from the religious origins of universities to the more secular took place at different times across the world. While the core of Confucianism is humanistic, with seats of learning in China being essentially secular, we know that Taxila and Nalanda in India also had strong secular traditions before the Reformation and Renaissance transformed uni European universities to secular institutions. The sense of a community pervaded Peradeniya from the very beginning and continues today. That community was strengthened by the free education policy that had such a deep impact on all levels of education in the country. It cannot but have influenced Peradeniya alumni as citizens of our country to bond together with other fellow citizens in times of civil strife of our country as well as in victory, in times of economic distress and in prosperity, and at times of natural calamity like the tsunami and abids the natural beauty with which we are so richly endowed right here in the verdant valley situated in the lap of majestic Hantana, with the Mahavali embracing this campus in its gently flowing arc. But it was not enough that there should be a sense of community. In 18th century Britain, Cardinal John Henry Newman in his famous The Idea of a University stated, and I quote, a university seems to be in its essence a place for the communication and circulation of thought by means of personal intercourse through a wide extent of country, unquote. So personal communication and thought were essential parts of the community that was a university. And a residential university as originally conceived by Sir Ivor Jennings was ideal for this purpose. The advent of the so-called knowledge-based society in which new knowledge, information and technologies increase in their significance as the foundation of activities in various fields such as politics, economics, and cultures, is enhancing the meaning of universities as the knowledge base. Professor Ramesh Thakur, now of the Australian National University, once wrote, and I quote, universities are the marketplace of ideas. The process of transformation of large and complex societies creates social ferment, disorder, dislocation, volatility, and sometimes even conflict. Universities often find themselves embattled because they are at the forefront of this struggle for social transformation. A university as a repository of scholarship is dedicated to teaching and research in the spirit of free and critical inquiry, 
tolerance of diversity and commitment to a resolution of any difference of opinion through dialogue and debate, unquote. As we all know, ladies and gentlemen, Peradenia has had more than its fair share of the upheavals and violence which our country has experienced. This has taught our students the resilience that they needed in their future lives. Peradenia could never have been an ivory tower isolated from the rest of the country. The 1971 and 88-89 insurgencies and the ethnic riots, especially in 1983, convulsed Peradenia as it did the rest of Sri Lanka and indeed caused the closure of the campus for long periods. But then life resumed and multi-ethnic and multi-religious student body and the academic staff came together once again, accepting our diversity and trying to deal with differences through dialogue and debate as befits a pluralist democratic society. Throughout these crises were the economic challenges that many students faced and for which the Mahapola scholarships were scarcely sufficient. An important component in any university is the notion of academic freedom. The University of Bologna adopted an academic charter, the 12th century Constitutio Habita, which guaranteed the rights of a traveling scholar to unhindered passage in the interests of education. Today, this is claimed as the origin of academic freedom and is now widely recognized internationally. On 18th September 1988, 430 university rectors signed the Magna Charta Universitatum marking the 900th anniversary of Bologna's foundation. The number of universities signing the Magna Carta Universitatum continues to grow, drawing from all parts of the world. Together with this academic freedom comes the autonomy of the university, which is guaranteed by the Universities Act in Sri Lanka. It is an indispensable feature of all universities and a fundamental principle of the Magna Carta of universities I just referred to. And I quote from it, the university is an autonomous institution at the heart of societies differently organized because of geography and historical heritage. It produces, examines, appraises, and hands down culture by research and te teaching. To meet the needs of the world around it, its research and teaching must be morally and intellectually independent of all political authority and economic power." Unquote. Peradenia's success in achieving this norm of academic freedom and autonomy, as we all know, has been inconsistent. Professor Kingsley de Silva, one of the most distinguished products of this university and the doyan of our historians has written in the University System of Sri Lanka, a book jointly edited by him and Professor G. H. Pieris, from whom you have just heard, published in 1995, says, and I quote, the relationship between the state and universities needs to reflect the international trend towards greater autonomy for the universities. Indeed, genuine autonomy is emerging as the only coherent and viable alternative to the institutional breakdown we have witnessed." Unquote. A civil society group I belong to, the Friday Forum, in a statement dated 27 January this year, had this to say about our universities in general, and I quote again, the appalling interference with universities is a manifestation of political authoritarianism in the governance of important public institutions. The totally erroneous perception that disregard of constitutional and legislative procedures is permitted in an all-powerful presidency and that ministerial decision-making outside the legal framework is permissible has contributed to passivity within university bodies which earlier would not have tolerated these intrusions. 
the decline in leadership in universities at the level of vice chancellors, and the undermining of institutional responsibility of university council, senate, and faculty boards has had and will continue to have a serious impact on the state university system. The politicization of appointments to university councils, which is very apparent in recent years, has made the governing bodies of these institutions incapable of giving the advice and guidance necessary for university governance." Unquote. A recent study of Commonwealth universities stated, universities have frequently been regarded as key institutions in processes of social change and development. The most explicit role they have been allocated is the production of highly skilled labor and research output to meet perceived economic needs. But to this role may be added, especially during periods of more radical change, roles in the building of new institutions of civil society, in encouraging and facilitating new cultural values, and in training and socializing members of new social elites. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that Peradenia has helped in elite formation by producing a set of administrators, teachers, economists, lawyers, business managers, scientists, doctors, engineers, agriculturalists, veterinary doctors, and others is incontestable. The World Bank has identified the complementary role of four key strategic dimensions to guide countries in the transition to a knowledge-based economy, an appropriate economic and institutional regime, a strong human capital base, a dynamic information infrastructure, and an efficient national innovation system. Tertiary education is central to all four pillars of this framework, but its role is particularly crucial in support of building a strong human capital base and contributing to an efficient national innovation system. Tertiary education helps countries build globally competitive economies by developing a skilled, productive, and flexible labor force, and by creating, applying, and spreading new ideas and technologies. A recent global study of patent generation has shown, for example, that universities and research institutes, rather than firms, drive scientific advances in biotechnology. Amongst a student population of over 11,000 students, the majority is female as it was even when I was a student. This surely is a tribute to the status of women in our society and equality of access to higher education. The fact that the annual intakes of students continues to show a higher percentage of women is proof of gender balance in a mature society and assures women of an equal and decisive role in maintaining and improving educational levels in our society. I must also pay a tribute to the alumni of this university in Sri Lanka and abroad for their national contribution, especially for the scholarship assistance provided so generously to current students. To proceed to the more concrete benefits accruing to the country from an annual average multidisciplinary graduate output of approximately 2,500 per annum from this university, let me mention as even-handedly as I can the eight faculties. The Faculty of Arts has the largest number of students and attracts the largest annual intake of students. It is, in fact, the largest arts faculty among all the universities in the country. It consists of 17 departments, teaching languages, and all disciplines in the humanities. And the Faculty of Arts of the University of Peradeni is one of the premier courses of teaching and research in the humanities and social sciences in the country. It has a long established research tradition and a highly respected publication record. During the 1940s and the 1950s, the Faculty of Arts and Oriental Studies published the first academic journals in the social sciences and the humanities in Sri Lanka, the University of Ceylon Review, and the Ceylon Journal of Social and Historical Studies. Since then, 
The faculty has commenced the publishing of two new journals, Sri Lanka Journal of Humanities and Modern Sri Lanka Studies in 1965. In 2002, the faculty launched two more journals in Singhala and Tamil media, Sambhavana and Palkalarai. The engineering faculty, located across the Mahavali with the renowned Professor E.O.E. E. Pereira, known as the father of modern engineering education in Sri Lanka, becoming vice chancellor, having headed the faculty, ranks with the University of Morotu as among the best in the island. It is the oldest engineering faculty in the country and has produced over a thousand engineering graduates, many of whom are eminent engineers and managers, while some are academics. The Engineering Design Center provides technical cooperation and professional engineering services with industry and government departments. The Faculty of Medicine has 16 departments with a teaching hospital that provides a great service to the public of Kandy and its environs. It has produced over 7,000 doctors since its inception, maintaining excellent cooperation with the government hospital in Kandy. The Faculty of Science with eight departments, also has a large number of students. Programs for the popularization of science among the school children, especially in the rural areas of the country, have been conducted through the Science Education Unit. The faculty provides analytical and consultancy services to the private and public sector through the Science Industry Interaction Cell. The Department of Statistics and Computer Science has developed a crime investigation decision support system for the Department of Police. The faculty is currently trying to find causes and solutions for the chronic kidney disease through the Center for Research, Training, and Education on Kidney Diseases established in the University of Peradeniya. Let me move on to the Faculty of Agriculture, which, as was said by Professor Pires, is the oldest in Peradeniya having been established in 1952. It has produced employable graduates in three disciplines, agricultural technology and management, food science and technology, and animal science and fisheries. These graduates are serving the country in diverse fields such as the agricultural service, scientific service, administrative service, foreign service, financial institutions, the Sri Lanka customs, aviation services, armed forces, the corporate sector, sector, etc. The Faculty of Allied Health Science is the youngest of the faculties having been established in 2007. It awards degrees in nursing, physiotherapy, medical laboratory, science, pharmacy, and radiography, and graduates find employment in the national and private hospitals. The Faculty of Dental Surgery is also the only fac dental faculty in the country and has a highly qualified staff preparing students with a Bachelor of Dental Surgery and postgraduate qualifications in oral surgery, orthodontics, restorative dentistry, and community dentistry. It received a generous grant from the government of Japan to set up a teaching hospital, which it runs and which treats over 12,000 patients per annum. Finally, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science is the only faculty training veterinarians in the country. Apart from having the only veterinary teaching hospital in Sri Lanka, it boasts an array of specialized services, including an elephant tranquilization service, an ambulatory service, a rabies diagnosis center. The faculty also offers postgraduate courses. Ladies and gentlemen, it is possible for me to identify illustrious Peradeniya dons and alumni who have made great national contributions to the various academic disciplines and professions they have adorned. However, to do so would be subjective and risk accidental but unforgivable omissions. In culture, the arts, literature, science, medicine, law, engineering, agriculture, veterinary medicine and dental science, there have been stars who have illuminated Peradeniya and Sri Lanka. Likewise, in all the professions, we have had Peradeniya alumni who have made valuable contributions to our country's development, except perhaps in politics, where we have regrettably had the least impact 
in terms of change agents of the prevailing political culture and value system. However, if I had to name just one individual who epitomizes Peradeniya's national contribution, or the Peradeniya Chintane, if I may use a popular term, it is Professor Edrivira Sarachandra. This is his birth centenary year, and it is fitting that a festival of his immortal plays should follow this event in the open air theater named after him. Deeply rooted in our folk culture, with a profound and liberal understanding of Buddhist philosophy and its broad inclusivity, his sensitive appreciation of music and theater, and the interplay of literary traditions in our country and the world, Sarachandra, more than anybody else, is the Peradeniya figure I would want future students to emulate. He is also symbolic of the national contribution of Peradeniya. Let me conclude now by emphasizing that a university is not a corporate body to be subjected to a cost-benefit analysis. Education is not a commodity in the marketplace, although many in Sri Lanka, including current policymakers, appear today to be treating it as such. I can do no better than quote the Singhala poem from the Vadan Kaviputta of the Kandyan period of Singhala literature. Tubu Tanaka Sura Saturan Gata Nohena Kopa Munat Rajamatidun Gata Nohena Esanda Manavat Vaturen Vala Nohena Ukata Mana Silpea Mai Matu Rakena. I thank you all for your patience in listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Jayanti Dhanapale, who doesn't want him to be introduced as doctor. I take this unusual approach of introducing him after we listen to him. Dr. Jayanti Dhanapale is a former United Nations Under Secretary General for Disarmament.